Let the church say amen. amen. God is good. All and all the time. Amen. Today we're back in the Gospel of John, John chapter 5. And it's interesting as you walk through the Gospel of John, you learn a lot of things about Jesus. In the very first chapter, you may recall that we see that Jesus is the eternal God, the living Word. He's the creator, the giver, sustainer of life. He's the light of the world. God, uh, John calls him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I love the way John starts out his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him there is nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He spells it out right there in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In chapter 2, we see that Jesus has the miraculous ability to turn plain drinking water into wine. And then in chapter 3, we see when Jesus has the conversation with Nicodemus that he is the love gift who was sent from the Father. Wasn't sent here to judge the world, as John 3.17 says, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? Are you with me this morning? Jesus came to provide the way to everlasting life. Last week, we looked at Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. And we saw that Jesus broke through racial barriers to save even those who were the outcast of society. John, in his gospel, wants you to know that Jesus is the Christ. That means the Messiah, the, the coming one, the one who was longed for. He wa That's his whole purpose. In the Gospel of John, he wants you to know that Jesus is the Christ, and he states his theme at the end of the book. John chapter 20, verse 31, we see that. This is his theme. This is his purpose for writing the Gospel. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Whenever you study a particular book of the Bible, you always want to look for the author's theme, his reason for writing that book, and it's going to help you in your understanding of that particular book. So in addition to John's theme of the gospel, he wants to show us that the glorious Lord Jesus is also Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals sickness and diseases. So today, as I said, we're going to look at John chapter 5, where Jesus healed the invalid man at the pool of Bethesda. And the first thing I want to point out from this passage is the knowledge of Jesus. The knowledge of Jesus. Jesus is in Jerusalem at this point, and he walks among a crowd of disabled and diseased people who are waiting there to be healed at the pool of Bethesda. It says, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water, Whoever then was first after the stirring of the water stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. This particular man in the story had been an invalid for 38 years. That's a long time, y'all. And this healing took place at the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means house of grace. The house of grace. The healing that takes place here is purely a work of grace. So it's very fitting that it takes place here. Grace, as you know, is unmerited favor. It's something that's unearned, undeserved. And it reminds us that our salvation is purely a work of grace. Amen? 
Ephesians 2 says we're saved by what? Grace through faith. It is a gift of God. It's not about work so that none of us can boast. So it's a good reminder for us. The knowledge of Jesus. Jesus knew all about this place. And he knew about every person that was there. He knew their problems. He knew their frustrations. He knew their disappointments. And Jesus knew all about this man's situation. So here this invalid man, he's paralyzed. He's unable to, to walk on his own. Probably somebody had to bring him there every day and, and help him to the pool to wait and hope for a miracle. But Jesus knew. He knew all about this man's condition. He knew about his situation. That's the knowledge of Jesus. And he knows you perfectly. He knows everything about you. He knows you inside and out. He knows everything you think or feel or do. He knows your problems. He knows your frustrations. He knows your pain. He knows your grief and your suffering and your disappointments. Because he is God, he knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows your words before they roll off your tongue. Jesus knows you intimately. He knows you better than you know yourself. Reminds me of Psalm 139, 4. David said, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. That's the knowledge of Jesus. And the more you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, the more precious that truth becomes. It's a precious thing to know that Jesus knows all about you. And not only that, but he understands what you go through. He can relate because he's been there. And he invites you to cast your care upon him. The psalmist said, cast your care upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Peter said, cast your care upon the Lord because what? He cares for you. Amen. Isn't that an amazing thing to realize that Jesus knows you so intimately? Amen and amen. Next thing I want to point out is the compassion of Jesus. This is one of the other things that make his knowledge of us so precious, the compassion of Jesus. Jesus chose to go to the pool of Bethesda. It says back in verse 1 that he was there for a feast. It doesn't tell us what feast it was, but it just says he was there for a feast. And while he's there for a feast, he decides to go to the pool of Bethesda. He didn't have to do it, but he did. But he knew what he was doing. He purposely went to this pool the same way he purposely, deliberately went through Samaria to talk to the woman at the well. Jesus knows your need, and he always moves toward your area of need. Let's pick up in verse 6. When Jesus saw the man lying there and he knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The man replied, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Do you want to be healed? It seems like an unusual question to ask a man who'd been sick for 38 years. But Jesus never asked a foolish question in his life. Amen. Obviously, it was important for this man to answer, or maybe at least to himself, do I really want to be healed? Because there are some people who don't want to be healed. Some people just have a victim mentality. They, they, they don't want to be helped out of their weakness. They rather just complain and they crave the attention of other people. You can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. Some people just don't want to admit that they need God's help. So Jesus asked this infirm man, do you want to be healed? And notice the man didn't answer Jesus' question. He starts making excuses as to why he couldn't be healed. He didn't have any idea that Jehovah Rapha was standing in front of him. The healer was right there in front of him. He was clueless. Do you want to be healed? Jesus may be asking you that same question today. Do you want to be healed? 
How do you respond when Jesus wants to heal you? Do you start making excuses? Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to heal your marriage. Jesus wants to heal your financial situation. Jesus wants to sanctify your tongue. You say, now you're meddling, pastor. Jesus wants to purify your mind. Jesus wants to deliver you from your addictions. Jesus wants to heal your codependency. But how often do we start making excuses as to why I can't be healed? Do you really want to be healed? The sick man started making excuses as to why he couldn't be healed because he couldn't get into the pool first. I don't know if you've ever thought about this scene. Just imagine that for a minute. It says back in verse 2 or 3, there was a multitude of people there. A huge crowd, a multitude. There may have been hundreds, maybe even thousands of people there. Everybody wanting to get into the pool first as soon as it starts bubbling so they could be healed. And it had to be a chaotic scene because just imagine somebody trying to pick this guy up and take him down there and put him in the water. And there's hundreds of other people trying to do the same thing so they can get in there first and be healed. Jesus didn't ask the man any more questions after he started making excuses. He took action. He just commanded him to do the impossible. But the thing about it is when Jesus commands you to do the impossible, he gives you the power to do it. Amen? Amen. Are you with me this morning? Look at what Jesus says. Get up. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once, it says the man was healed And what did he do? He took up his bed and he walked. Immediately healed. Jesus healed the man's miserable situation simply out of his compassion. There's several times in the Gospels where we see Jesus move to compassion. Sometimes so much so that he's moved to tears. I think about how at the death of Lazarus, he was so compassionate he was moved to tears. I think about the time he he stood and, and looked at Jerusalem and he just wept. Jesus is a compassionate, caring God. Amen? Not only does Jesus know you perfectly, but he is compassionate. He is moved by what you go through. He is moved by your grief and your pain and your heartaches and your heartbreaks and your sickness and your suffering. In Jesus, we have a God who knows and understands. Amen. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Whatever you're going through, he's been there. And when it comes to suffering, nobody has suffered more than Jesus. Isaiah prophesied of him that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Jesus knows your pain. Jesus understands your suffering. And he's a compassionate and caring God. I like Psalm 103, 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Jesus knows what you're going through. And he's a compassionate and caring God who wants to help you in your misery. Jesus is our great high priest who can sympathize and empathize with our weaknesses. That's what the author of Hebrews was talking about when he wrote this in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. He says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Let me turn that around for you. Because by him putting the word not in there, he's giving you the negative. But look at it from a positive perspective. We do have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Amen? Amen? That's Jesus. He is our great high priest. He has been in every respect tempted as we are, yet without sin. That makes all the difference in the world. That's what qualified him to be our Savior. He was sinless. And then we're beckoned. Let us then with confidence draw near 
to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. One other thing I want to point out to you this morning from this passage is the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus. The knowledge of Jesus is complete. He knows everything about you. And his compassion toward you is great. The Lord has compassion on us. He remembers that we're just dust. But now we're going to see that his power is immediate and sovereign. Going back to verses 8 and 9, Jesus said, Get up! Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. He took up his bed and walked. At once signifies the immediacy and the sovereignty of Jesus' power. Jesus told the man, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at first the man was probably thinking, well, I've been an invalid for 38 years. I can't walk. I can't get up. I can't carry my bed. But then he started to feel the power of Jesus. Oh, I can imagine how he just felt the warm rush of red blood flowing through his veins again like he hadn't felt in 38 years. I mean, think about it. This man had been atrophied and withered and dried up for 38 years. But when Jesus spoke immediately, he felt all those muscles and tendons and ligaments and bones just spring back to life. Imagine the shock and surprise as the power of God surged through this man's body. He didn't need an angel to move the waters. He didn't need somebody to get him into the pool of Bethesda. All he needed was the power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. He was instantly healed at once. It says immediately the sovereign power of the word of the Lord healed the man. And he got up and he walked. Amen. Amen. The power of God. Think about the joy that must have overcome this man as he realized what had just happened. He immediately trusted Jesus at his word and obeyed his commands. I wish we would do that. I wish we would take Jesus at his word and obey his commands. Amen. Amen. Man took his bed. He got up and he walked. He went from invalid to valid. He went from infirmed to firm. He could get up. He could carry his bed. He could walk. Praise God. He hadn't been able to do that for almost 40 years. So John shows us the complete knowledge, the heartfelt compassion of Jesus, and the sovereign power of Jesus Christ. See, this is why you need to know Jesus is Lord of your life, and you need to develop a relationship with him. Amen? I mean, he already knows you intimately, and you can know him intimately through his word. Amen? Talk to Jesus. Tell him your thoughts and feelings. Ask him to direct your thoughts and words and deeds so that your transformed life can bring him glory. And stay in fellowship with Jesus all throughout the day. Too often we're in touch with God in the morning and then we go our way and we just forget all about him. If you're a true believer, you have the spirit of Christ living within you. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Not an imaginary one, but a real, risen, living Lord Jesus who reveals himself with absolute, ultimate authority. The story goes on that the man, once he was healed, he went to the temple and he got in trouble with the Jews for carrying his bed on the Sabbath. Who told you you could carry your bed on the Sabbath? Don't you know it's against the law to do that? It's the Sabbath. He said, the man who healed me, he told me, take up your bed and walk. You think they would have said, well, who healed you? I want to go see this man. I want to find out. I want to learn about him. Could he be the Christ? Like the woman at the well? Maybe he's the Christ. No, they were just concerned about him breaking the law, the Sabbath. He disobeyed one of their regulations. They were only focusing on the letter of the law rather than marveling at the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord 
of the Sabbath. Amen? Amen. It's like Jesus said in another passage, the Sabbath uh, wasn't made, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was right for Jesus to heal the man on the Sabbath. But at this point, the man didn't even know who had healed him because it says Jesus had slipped into the crowd as he often did. What is interesting about this passage is that Jesus wasn't content to just perform a random miracle and leave this man in ignorance as to who he was. Because it says Jesus went and found the man in verse 14. Isn't that just like Jesus? He found you. He's the one that pursued you. He's the one that came looking for you. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But Jesus pursued you. Jesus wooed you. And by the power of God, you came to Jesus. John 15, what did he say? You didn't choose me, but what? I chose you. Look at verse 14. It says, afterward, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, this gives us some insight into this man's infirmity. This statement tells us that his sickness was a direct result of his sin. Now, we know that ultimately all sickness, all disease, all death is an indirect result of sin. But obviously, this man's illness was a direct result of his sin. And even though this invalid man had a great need to be healed, that wasn't the ultimate point for Jesus. The issue was not mainly his physical health, but his holiness. Jesus let the man know that, yes, you've been physically healed, but now you need to be spiritually healed. He was concerned about his holiness. His sins had been forgiven. He had been washed clean. He was a new man, both physically and spiritually. That's just like Jesus. When he finds you wherever you are, he wants to heal you. Primarily, he wants to heal your soul. And that's the very reason he came into the world. I'm amazed that Jesus would come into this world he created, knowing what he'd have to go through. That would have deterred most of us. But out of love, Jesus came because he wanted to save us. And he was willing to turn himself over to the hands of evil men to be tortured and crucified for our salvation. He was willing to have Spikes driven through his hands and his feet and hang there for six hours suffering for your salvation and my salvation. That's the reason he came into this world, to provide salvation for all who will receive him. Jesus wants to forgive your sin. He wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But he also wants to heal your home. He also wants to heal your mind. He also wants to heal your marriage. He also wants to heal your relationships. He also wants to heal your finances and your addictions and your anxiety and your tongue if you just stop making excuses and let him have his way. Amen? His way is always best. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are my thoughts than yours. Thus says the Lord. He knows what's best. Whether Jesus heals you physically or spiritually, I want you to know that his goal is not just your physical well-being. His goal is always to make you holy. Leviticus 11.44 says, You shall be holy because the Lord your God is holy. And then Peter picks up on that, 1 Peter 1.16. He says basically the same thing in the New Testament. You shall be holy, for I am holy. That's Jesus' goal for your life. Not just to heal you spiritually and physically, but so that you would be holy. We are healed to be holy.
whatever you're dealing with today, maybe a sickness, maybe a disease, maybe a disability, I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus walked into a crowd of invalids. It says a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. He could have spoken a word and everybody there would have been healed. But he only chose one man to heal. He doesn't always heal everybody. And that's important to know. But then he found the man later and he put the focus on his holiness. He said, go and sin no more. Jesus manifested his power and glory by physical healing and then spiritual cleansing and forgiveness. Because he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our sin and unrighteousness. When Jesus came into the world the first time, we just got a sample. We just got a taste of his healing power. But the complete healing from all of our sickness, all of our disease, and all of our disabilities will happen at the second coming of Christ. Amen? But the aim of these samples is his glory. It's to call you to faith and holiness. I believe in divine healing. I believe in divine healing. Some of you are walking miracles. Some of you have been healed of tumors and cancer and strokes and all kinds of things. There are times when God does miraculously heal your body. But then other times he allows us to suffer. It's just according to his will. And then when you've suffered enough, you receive the ultimate healing and God takes you home to be with him. Amen? I call that the ultimate healing. Physical healing is the exception and it's not the rule. As I said, Jesus could have healed everybody at the pool of Bethesda, but he chose one man. And he healed him physically and then he focused on his holiness. Go and sin no more. Jesus probably left hundreds, maybe even thousands of people there unhealed at the pool of Bethesda, but he doesn't heal everybody. And the one man he did heal, he told him that he was more concerned about his spiritual condition. And so the main issue until Jesus comes back is this, that we meet him in our brokenness and we receive the power of his forgiveness to pursue holiness. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 tells us the purpose of our salvation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? So that we would be what? Holy, Holy and blameless before him. That's why he saved you. Not just to give you a get out of hell free card. He saved you so that you would be holy and blameless before him. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? God desires your healing, primarily your spiritual healing. But as I said earlier, he also wants to heal your heart. He wants to heal your mind. He wants to heal your marriage and your relationships and your finances and your addictions and your anxiety and your tongue and your doubts and your fears so that you can be holy just as he is holy. Amen. Amen. But you got to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in you. He wants to transform you, but you must allow the Holy Spirit to do his work within you. You have been healed to be holy. Let the church say amen. amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you again for your word. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals all our sickness and diseases. You heal us spiritually. Sometimes you heal us physically. Other times you allow us to suffer. And maybe that's just so that we'll draw near to you. 
And you promise if we draw near to God, you would draw near to us. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. You proved your love by sending your son into the world to be our savior. And we thank you for that. And Father, there's probably somebody here today or maybe somebody watching online and they have never submitted to Jesus. They're still just caught up in living life their own way and digging a deeper hole. And I pray that right now, the, the word of God that has gone forth today would, would pierce them. The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to pierce between uh, soul and spirit and joint and marrow. And I just pray that you would implant the engrafted word of God in their heart and their mind their soul and change their lives today that they would receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. And Father, for us who have already received you, we have been healed spiritually, but maybe you want to do some more healing in our lives. Maybe you want to heal our marriage. Maybe you want to heal our relationships. Maybe you want to heal our, our minds, renew our minds through your word. Maybe you want to heal our tongue or our fears and doubts and anxieties. And I just pray that we would allow the Holy Spirit to do his transforming work in us and through us. We just want you to be glorified, Lord. We were created for your glory. May we live for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.